Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show. We give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is Mark Ellis. Welcome one and all to the best movie news show in the entire galaxy. Here from our Collider <laughs> Studios, a 100% spider-free zone. <laughs> no, we're not talking about you, Tom Holland. On today's episode, Venom gets independent, the pitches get back together, and Optimus Prime gets deported. Ashley, who's joining me today? Also here is Clark Wolf. Hey guys, thank you so much for having me. Happy Monday. <laughs> also here is Jeremy John. I forgot to wear my coat at the beginning of this and now I'm stuck without it forever. <laughs> That's life. <laughs> Monday. <laughs> Also, you're Christian Harlow. Yeah, tell you, I like those little summaries that you do, because I was like, yeah, wait a minute. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we're going to talk about the... Nice. Yeah, good. Well, thank you for studying the show notes. Uh, <laughs> we do have an announcement up top, though. As some of you guys may know or may have speculated, John Campia has resigned from Collider, so he will no longer be hosting Movie Talk. However, we wish him all the best in all of his future endeavors. And I can say from a personal note, he's always the consummate on-screen professional. And we are the co-founders of the Top Secret is the Best 1980s Comedy Ever Made Movement. So thank you guys for joining us in our continuing fight. Ashley, what is our first topic today? With Spider-Man Homecoming less than two weeks away, Tom Holland is making the press rounds to promote the movie. And with Sony also developing their own shared universe with the upcoming Venom starring Tom Hardy, fans are hoping to get definitive confirmation that the two will cross over into the same universe. In an exclusive interview with Collider's own Steve Frosty Weintraub, Frosty asked if the two characters are indeed in separate universes. Here's a clip. I have to ask you, there's been a lot of conjecture online about whether or not Spider-Man and Venom can be in the same movie, yes. what's, so what's Sony, what's Marvel, all that stuff. So, from what I understand, Venom, separate universe than Spider-Man, but is that true, is that not true, what, what's the thing? Sadly, I think that is true, you know? From my understanding, I think that is the case, you know? I'd love to make a movie with Tom Hardy. Um, if we ever got to the chance to make a Venom movie together, that would be super cool. Um, but his movie would have to take place in the MCU because I'm not giving up my ticket in the MCU. Well, that, exactly. See, my, my thing is that I'm wondering, can you like swing by in like an establishing shot in the Venom movie? Or yeah. is that like, <laughs> is that establishing shot alone make Venom immediately in the MCU? It would. It definitely would, you know. And uh, yeah, we'll have to wait and see what happens. Um, I mean, if it did happen, it would be very cool. But as of now, I know nothing about it. So, Mark, thoughts on Holland's comments about Venom and Spidey being from separate universes? Boy, that was pretty interesting, wasn't it, Ashley? Because all this information that came out last week where it appeared that we might see Spider-Man in a Venom movie or there are other subsequent pictures at Sony Studios, now that does not seem to be the case. And backing up is none other than Amy Pascal, the producer extraordinaire at Sony, because she was also interviewed by Frosty. Frosty made the rounds this weekend, man. He really crushed it with the Spider-Man Homecoming coverage. He's also seen the movie, so I'm insanely jealous of him. What Amy Pascal said, and I will quote you guys here, is that for now, it is correct. Frosty asked, to be, to be definitive, will Spider-Man not be appearing in these spinoffs? And she said, for now, that's correct. All of them are part of the Marvel comic universe, but not all of them are part of the Marvel cinematic universe. So, Jeremy, it would appear that maybe when she was speaking about it last week and she surprised everybody, including Kevin Feige, that maybe it was just a <laughs> misnomer that, no, 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 we're all part of the Marvel comic universe. Yeah, come on in, Wolverine, X-Men. We're all part of the Marvel comic universe, just not the Marvel cinematic universe. What does this new news from Frosty's interviews bring to you? I love the fact that now it's being spun. Like, she was like, no, I was talking about the comic book. It's like, yes, we know that. Do you... <laughs> What about the movies? <laughs> and I feel bad for every actor after that statement because they're going to get bombarded with, well, is it, isn't it? So now it looks like, all right, so she's pretty much doing what I always do with Star Trek and Star Wars. Like, no, you know, they're they're part of the same, right? They, who's to say they're not? They all, who's to say they're not? You know, so, I mean, the fact that she even said it, um, would, uh, Feige looked confused that it was said, right? So at that point, you think, well, why was he confused that it was said? So we're thinking maybe she wasn't supposed to say it yet. Maybe it's true, but, you know, it shouldn't be revealed yet. Maybe it's completely false. It looks like he was confused because the statement is, well, no, they're not actually part of the cinematic universe. Though, it is, if that's a quote, so she starts out as of now. Is how she started out? How, how did she start As that? of now. As of for now. For now, okay. it is If correct. they respond to my please. <laughs> <laughs> right. right, so for now, it looks like it's possible later is what for now means. So it, it looks like they're, they're not. But you can't prove that they're not if they're in different locations. So 
That's what they're saying. Yeah, Clark, you always have to build in the the for now, just in case. Yes. I mean, if Spider-Man is available, he wants to come off the bench, <laughs> he doesn't have any available. more homework to do. They would obviously want him in the standalone movies, but the rest of the interview with Collider was very telling because it seems like both Pascal and Feige are on the same page from the standpoint of when you make a new franchise. Mm -hmm. So with him, it was Iron Man, or with this, it's going to be Venom. You, you aim to make a great film. You aim to make a great Venom movie, not a great movie that is going to help take part in this bigger franchise. So they're just focusing on getting Venom off the ground. Is that how you see it? Yeah, I mean, it sounds like it. Look, I think that if I'm Kevin Feige and I've been overseeing this incredibly commercially and critically successful universe for the last 15 or 10 years, however long, um, I would be very, very hesitant to give out any creative control to Sony, especially with the... Uh, these characters. So basically what I'm saying is uh, the fact that, that it, the MCU was able to use Spider-Man was a huge get, right? And if now that Spider-Man is back in the public's good graces, because I think we can all agree that Amazing Spider-Man 2 wasn't necessarily the best received by fans or critics, um, I would not I think that for Kevin Feige to to let Spider-Man be involved with Venom and all of these bigger things, they're going to need the creative control. If I'm Kevin Feige, I'm not trusting Sony with with this with the brand. That's right. So Christian, I mean, you made the joke earlier, but it's like they would probably want to get Spider-Man in their movie or Iron Man or anybody else to come in and hang out with Venom. How likely do you think that possibility is now after seeing all this? I think it goes exactly what Clark's talking about is that Sony doesn't have the best track record right now without Marvel with them you know so i think that when that was initially made and you saw kevin feige like well what what this is not right but you know he also knew that he's got it behind closed doors the other thing is i just don't and i've never thought i don't think amy pascal is is the best uh, movie maker i mean as far as a producer i just i don't think she's the best i mean you go i hate to bring it to those leaks those sony leaks because those shouldn't have got out in the first place but when you read some of those conversations too i think she is kind of the epitome of what the studio executive is is and she's made some really bad choices in the past. She was primarily responsible for that amazing Spider-Man 2. You look at the way she kind of pissed Fincher off with uh, with the Steve Jobs movie and all these other things that happened too. I, and I just don't think she even understands the Marvel Cinematic Universe as far as the way that it is. It, it, she just throw that out there like that. So I, I do think it has a lot to do with Pascal. I really do. And I think that if they can deliver if they can deliver a solid movie, I think for as long as Tom Holland is locked into the MCU, I don't know what his deal is with the spy with Sony and how long if he's required to make more movies with them. We know that he's locked down for Spider-Man. I think for its three films at least for do the Spider-Man franchise with the MCU. We think, right? Who knows? I just don't think that you're going to see him anywhere near these Sony movies until that's all done. The Avengers movies are all done and finished. Because, uh, yeah, I just I want to see how this whole thing comes to be. I'm excited about this Venom movie, though. I am. It's not one of these things where I'm like, ah, oh, why are they doing it? I think that they can start to build something pretty special. But I think before you start locking it into the MCU, you got to prove yourself first. Jeremy, you and I don't read much. But when we do, it's usually accompanied with pictures that feature superheroes <laughs> in panel form. How disappointing would this news be to somebody like you who loves the Spider-Man Venom you know, anti-hero, whatever you want to call it, relationship that they had to not have that in this movie. Well, uh, first of all, uh, coloring also is a very big part of how I read. So <laughs> as long as there are crayons and pictures we'll that I can color in. We'll get you the menu at Denny's. It's good. That's what I'm talking about, the little crayons and the pancakes. Uh, but for me, I had already accepted the reality of the situation that they were not linked. And then there was this little like, oh, they're linked, but Feige's reaction made you think, well, maybe they're not, and now they're not again. So it was one of those things where I never accepted the reality that they're going to be linked for months. I've been like, okay, it's a standalone Venom movie with Tom Hardy. So I'm interested in that because of, like, what got me on board with it is Tom Hardy. At first I was like, you know, could be interesting, we'll see. And then Tom Hardy comes on, you're like, the dynamic shifts. It, it's now a movie... I do want to see, and I want to see where it goes. I hope it lands, because like Christian was saying, if everything sticks to landing, then we might see some mergers start to happen. But as for right now, the reality of the situation is what the reality was months ago, and that is they're, they're not linked right now. You yeah. love Las Vegas. I have a residency in yeah. Laughlin. Let's do the percentage game. <laughs> 
What's your percentage that Tom Holland actually does make an appearance in Venom? Well, the other thing you got to realize too, before you do the percentages here, is that Sony still owns the character. Sony still owns. That's a great point, right? Spider Man. You got you, that. That is one thing that we have to remember. That there's a deal that they made with Marvel, but Sony still owns mm -hmm. it now. For how long? What they can do? What was made in this deal? We don't know. So the percentages of what's going to happen, uh, I'm, I'm say it's pretty low. I'd say 10 percent because I think they're. I think that's the point that Marvel want, wanted to make. Probably, as long as he's in our movies right now. You can't put them in these other spin-off things that you do because not only are they worried about quality and stuff, because even if they're great, I think it's a low percentage because they want to focus and they want to get away from the confusion. Now, whether or not they start pulling everything together and say, well, Venom's actually part of it, and then I think connecting it to the Avengers and Guardians gets too hectic. So I'm going to say it's low. It's at 10%. I'm right there with them. I'm, I'm going to say it's maybe 20% that he pops into the movie because you do have to allow for some sort of wiggle room because they just retracted comments that we heard from last week. So maybe next week we have an entirely different picture. Clark, as of right now, the percentage that Tom Holland is Spidey in a Venom movie. Yeah, I think it's low. I agree with you guys. However, I think the percentage chance that down the road in five years, let's say, Tom Holland shows up in Sony uh, produced properties might be good. But I think, it, like I was saying earlier, that Sony is going to have to cede creative control or or at least have Marvel in, in the room. So, But for the Tom, Tom Hardy... It, Tom Holland and Tom Hardy is a bit confusing. <laughs> the Toms. The Toms. Toms. For the Toms, I don't think that they're going to come together. Jeremy, give me a decimal. Move that period <laughs> two places to the right and tell me what your percentage is. I'm going to split the difference between you guys 15% because it does have to be wiggle room because of ownership. But the only reason you would have uh, Tom Holland cameo is if he is linked to Venom. And if you look at everything in Civil War, it looks like Spider-Man had just started out. It looks like uh, Spider-Man Homecoming. Uh, picks up shortly after that, so I don't see any room where Tom Har uh, Tom Holland's Spider. But that is hard to differentiate. Right? Tom. Uh, I don't see any room where Spider Man had the symbiote suit. So at that point, like, why have him cameo? Be careful, buddy. Nobody out Tom's Clark Wool. All right, let's move on to our next tale, Ashley. Via a report from Slash Film, Josh Trank is finally moving forward on his follow-up to Fantastic Four, hitting Instagram to announce filming on Fonzo, a film adaptation of The Life of Al Capone that will star Tom Hardy and will begin production this summer in New Orleans. The movie isn't a controversial biopic and will instead begin with Capone at age 47, sorry, a conventional biopic, and will instead begin with Capone at age 47 after he spent a decade in prison with dementia rotting his mind. Once freed, Capone's past becomes present as memories of his violent and brutal beginnings melt into his waking life. The movie will hit theaters sometime in 2018. Christian, are you excited about Josh Trank's new movie, Fonzo, starring Tom Hardy? Very much so. I think that this is exactly what Josh Trank needs to do to get back on the board. I think this is something that he wanted to do. I think that um, you know we had, a, we had a chance to talk to him last year when all this stuff with Fantastic Four was happening, and and he had mentioned uh, to us a little gangster movie he was working on, and the little gangster of Capone isn't really a little gangster, but I I, I know it's the, it's the little filmmaking that he's going back to, which I think is where he shines, and I think by getting someone like Tom Hardy to do it is great, and I also love the idea that they're doing it from the fact that when he's 47, because that's a Capone. When you think of Al Capone, you think of Al Capone like the one that the tough murdering gangster you don't think of him as this kind of fragile crazy person and that's what he was at the end of his life and he and to see these kind of demons karma hunting hunting him down haunting him it's and hardy being the guy to do that it reminds me of what when you see what tom hardy can do as an actor if it's bronson or or Locke, those types of movies where you're really the the inner working of someone of a human's brain, what he can do, and to see him play someone with dementia and someone like Al Capone with dementia, Al Capone by himself was was out of his mind. <laughs> Add dementia to it. This is something I cannot wait to see. I am very excited to see Josh Trank get back on because this town is, even though we are a very judgmental town, uh, it is also very forgiving. If he can knock it out of the park with this, I think that um, audiences all over will invite Josh Trank back. Make another one. Yeah, I mean, there's somebody like Tom Hardy who has played a gangster already in multiple movies. He even played two gangsters in one movie. He's just <laughs> that good. It's great casting, but more to the level of Trank. You want to see what that guy can do when he's not handcuffed by a studio. I know that there's a lot of reports about a lot of various things that went on on the set that Josh Trank was in control of. This is a very different kind of movie. This is not a huge franchise he's making this is a smaller movie along what you said like, like Locke is a good example of the, now it's not all going to take place in one car but watching Al Capone not in the classic 
you know, the untouchable style of Al Capone, but after all of his mob glory days, if you will, getting into this person, deteriorating in front of your eyes and still trying to have some recall as to what his life has been up to that point. I don't know if Trank's the right guy. I'm interested to see what he can do with it, but it seems like a project he's really excited about. How about you, Clark? Yeah, I agree with kind of everything you guys just said. And and look, I didn't give up on Josh Trank after Fantastic Four. I mean, we don't we were not there. We've all heard the rumors, whatever. I, I still think that Chronicle is an excellent film. I think the acting in it is excellent, and I think what he was able to do with such a small scale and working within that world was outstanding. And so I actually want to see more from Josh Trank, and to echo what you all said, I think this is a great step back into movie making. And by the way, the fact that somebody like Tom Hardy wants to work with Josh Trank after this, uh, after what happened on Fantastic Four, I think really says something about the fact that he's passionate about this, that they're both passionate about the material. And uh, f and finally, in terms of the Al Capone of it all, you know, I cannot believe that after Al Capone, <laughs> Al Capone, <laughs> Al Capone <laughs> has been in uh, pop culture and, you know, it, for, for as long as that, I didn't know this part of the story. I did not mm. know this until I read it in the show notes this morning. And so I think it's a fascinating idea. It's a great take on, on material that you've already known. And Hardy is such a chameleon. He, to me, is one of the most, uh, you know, uh, uh, he's such a character actor. I've said this before about Jude Law, and I agree. I think they're both character actors in leading men faces. Um, but I love <laughs> that Hardy is not afraid of prosthetics and not afraid to, like, you know, to gain weight, to lose weight, whatever. So um, I, I think that this sounds like a great combination. Such really a curse excited. for an actor. Man, I'm such a character. <laughs> Director, but I'm so beautiful but on the so outside. Handsome. Jeremy, it's not you're fair. a gorgeous drop of man. What do you say? <laughs> I got nothing to say to that. I think you just said it. Thank you. Thank you, Mark Ellis. High school me. Thank you for your Did you know Al Capone is one of the first people to be treated with penicillin? Yeah. I did not. You prefer know that. penicillin on your pizza. Uh, the, uh, ooh, Ninja Turtles <laughs> reference right there. Uh, are we gonna address the fact that the first two stories of the day had to do with Tom, Tom Hardy? Hardy. Yeah, he's <laughs> the everywhere. guy's just taking over Hollywood. Uh, I'm of two minds on this one. I, I want to see this phase of his life. Life because like Clark, I, I don't know much about it at all. I didn't know he had dementia when he died. I might have read it on Facebook once, twice, removed in an article that someone posted from something, uh, <laughs> in which case you got to take it with a grain of salt. But apparently, yeah, he had dementia when he died. There's a part of me that wants, that thinks that I'm going to want to just I'm usually interested in characters or people in their prime. It's like Indiana Jones and Crystal Skulls. Like, I don't want to see him when he's old. I want to see him in his prime. So I, I'm wondering if I'm going to be more interested in the mob dynamic of his life rather than him being an old man with dementia. But I am interested in the old man with dementia. And so I do want to see that phase in his life. Anyone can do it. Tom Hardy can. Well, one of the things I think is so fascinating about that is in the report there is that it's him and his life kind of catching up with him after he, he kind of got out. And it's what did the landscape from the mob look like when Al Capone was in charge of things years later, mm -hmm. when he got in the 50s and the 60s and the, the Goodfellas era or whatever, mm -hmm. all that stuff happened. Very curious to see that dynamic. And as you see everything going around you, what you used to run, plus the fact that you have this thing going on in your brain, and an actor like Tom Hardy, it could be something. That's mm -hmm. right. It was dementia brought on by syphilis, kids. Right. That's right. Al Capone had <laughs> syphilis. <laughs> Be careful out there, y'all. All right, what's our next story, Ashley? <laughs> it's Monday, which means it's time for the weekend box office report. Transformers The Last Night opened to a franchise low, taking the number one spot with $45.3 million over the weekend for a combined $69.1 million over five days. Disney's Cars 3 and DC Films Wonder Woman tied for the number two and three spots, with both studios reporting an estimated $25.175 million weekend. Wonder Woman dropped only 39% in its fourth weekend in release, and has a domestic total just shy of 320 million. 47 meters down took the number four spot with an estimated 7.4 million, bringing its domestic total to 24 million. And rounding out the top five is Lionsgate's All Eyes on Me. The movie dropped nearly 80% in its second weekend with an estimated 5.85 million, with its domestic total now hitting 38.6 million. Clark, thoughts on Transformers the last night opening to a franchise low this past weekend? Yeah, I mean, it looks like it really is the last night for the last time <laughs> for this. Uh, I don't know, because, you know, we look, we all we all know that uh, international box office with these huge Hollywood blockbusters is honestly most likely what the studio is looking for. However, the fact that the numbers were 
I mean, it didn't even break a hundred million dollars in five days. That for Transformers, that's that's not good. Um, so I, I think this might be it for Transformers for now. But we'll in this carna- incarnation. Hopefully, Michael Bay will move on and do something a little more along the lines of the pains and gains of the world. Um, but I think that it's important to. There's two things uh, here that I think are important to note. First of all, Wonder Woman hanging on in its fourth week, just shy of 320 million domestic. That is that is legit. That's that's those are fabulous numbers. But also, I wanted to mention forty-seven meters down. Forty-seven meters down, you got this big smile on your face. Sharks. <laughs> uh, so so I think it's really important for us to pay attention to the fact that last year, after the Shallows proved to be a big hit. Uh, 47 Meters Down was going direct to DVD like a week or two later and they yanked it off there and said nope we're going to release this in theaters and sure enough here they are this little shark movie has now taken in almost 25 million dollars domestically I think that that's that's a that's a pretty big deal um, yes, because the other thing is that's what they thought it was going to make its opening weekend was about six million, and the fact that right. it made that in week two yes. is is absolutely it's that's a hit for them. It really is. Unfortunately, the thing I have to disagree with you, and I want it to be true. Oh, about Transformers. Yes, it is not the last because they don't care about uh, U.S. box office anymore. They're not making these movies for the U.S. anymore. There's there were interviews that I read with Gerard Car- Carmichael over the weekend. There were certain jokes that he had made and that he had kind of brought up and tried on set. And Bay said, it's funny, but the problem is that won't play in China. They're very aware of the international box office. And whether or not we like it or not, the international box office, the international audience loves these movies. It's already made $245 million. It's already made over. Here, not so much. We will see another one. Because they're going to release it here, and even oh, you know what, we'll get thirty million in, in the U.S. here, and then great, but we'll, we'll make our money back and tenfold because they're going to make a lot of money overseas. They're continuing to do it. I, you can say a lot of things about Michael Bay as a filmmaker, if you want. He knows how to play to international box office. That is why he has done five, six, twenty of these movies already, and he'll continue to do it as long as he wants to. Whether he says it's his last or not, he makes them a lot of money on these things. And this version of it, unfortunately, I could happen again because they keep making money. Are you saying that the jokes that were in Transformers the last night do play well? No, 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 no. They don't play well at all. But but they might That's play a very better. Good point. But, but they might play better to international audiences because I had this whole argument or conversation with Roca in the fact that um, it was. I think that there's certain things for like there's reasons why comedies like Dumb and Dumber and things like won't play. Overseas, it just there's there's a culture. It's it's, it's different. So I thought that that you know international audiences uh, audiences aren't going to Transformers for the humor for the jokes because it's not hitting them at all. And I think that they're going for the spectacle for to see the Transformers fighting. To where Roca then said, well, I think that they're actually playing the jokes for the audiences. Who the hell knows? Who knows how it transfers over? I don't think that's the case. I think that they're going there for the spectacle of it. Doesn't matter because the dialogue doesn't need to play. It's there are Transformers. They are fighting. This is cool. Here's our money. Roka in an argument? Get right out of town. <laughs> Jeremy, what's your take on the box office? Funny thing is, in a lot of the comments of my Transformers videos, you'll always see those people like, just popcorn American nonsense, like guests made for overseas markets. I just find that really <laughs> interesting. But yeah, I mean, I feel like people are kind of wise to the act of a lot of things. You look at the new Pirates movie, it was its all-time low. Transformers, it was its all-time low. I think, you know, people... At least in America, are like, eh, hey, well, we need something else. Wonder Woman, I'm glad that that's crazy. If you look at the next four, uh, save for the first one, but two, three, four, and five, I feel like that was the top five. And everything just got shuffled down, but is everything in the same place? I might be looking that up. Um, love that Wonder Woman's holding on. That's, I mean, easily, it's the best popcorn flick you can go out there and watch now because it does have like gravity to it and gravitas, but. 47 meters down, I agree with you. If you can take a movie and make it for seven bucks and it makes money, Mm -hmm. that's a profit. I mean, it was, I thought the movie was eh, but uh, for what it is and for what it's done, it was a smart marketing move. Still haven't seen Eyes on Me. I want to see Eyes on Me, but again, going back in time to watch the movies that came out a week or two ago is harder going forward when you still have things coming out in the summertime. But so far, well, Transformers, I'll see you for Transformers 6. That's the next well, one, right? So actually, I have a question about that. Do you guys think that we're going to get a Transformers 6 proper, or do you think that it's going to be a spinoff with that whole big writer's room that they assembled? Because the, They're doing Bumblebee first. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. that's what I was going to say. Like When I say that I think this is done, I think... 
this, uh, what we've got right now, this one, two, three, four, five, I think that is probably finished. However, they're not going to give up on Transformers in terms of like the cinematic franchise, but I'm curious what you guys. Yeah, think. and I also just can't trust directors or actors for that matter when they say, "Oh no, I'm I'm retiring from this franchise right. or I'm leaving right. this." Like you might leave it for a little bit and then really get hungry for that money or some other you know opportunity to tell a new story in this universe that you really care about. So Bumblebee will be next, and then we have to see whether Michael Bay wants to stay away from his own franchise. What we can hope is that because Travis Knight, who directed Kubo and Two Strings, is directing the Bumble his Bumblebee, and what I was worried about was that they were going to do like an ET or like a um, Iron giant type movie because that seems predictable and sure enough they said it's going to be like iron giant so but we saw what travis knight was able to do with kubo and two strings very emotional movie put things together very well if he can do that with bumblebee and if this is the first transformers movie you really emotionally care about mm -hmm. what i'm hoping is that they go well wait that's the best critically we've ever done. Financially, probably not. But critically, that's the best we've ever done. Should we shift and get away from this Michael Bay thing and see how we do? Or can we please, we talked about this on Movie Talk and, uh, a couple of months ago, but can we embrace the, the fun and crazy of having G.I. Joes and Transformers yes. like, together? This they got to get that. They got to they lock down what G.I. Joe is first. It's such a mess and, Well, right and now. that's fair. But what I'm saying is that, you know, like that was apparently Michael Bay was adamant about, no, we're not doing these like, you know, know silly goofy crossovers so what you know if they're if you're going in more heartfelt family friendly you know bumblebee direction why can't we start having a little bit of fun with gi joes and transformers well, they did in the, the comics same they did yeah, in the exactly. comics yeah. and those comics were great because i did read so i read a lot for this show i did a <laughs> lot of preparation bumblebee. they killed bumblebee really bumblebee. yeah oh, okay i didn't get that far i don't like when transformers die not a fan of it thank you Cody. <laughs> nice <laughs> flash from the 1986 <laughs> comic book <laughs> let's move on now to buy or sell this is the part of the show where ashley is going to give us a topic we simply say whether we buy it or sell it and throw some elbows in the process what's up first universal pictures has released the first pitch perfect three trailer now graduated from college and out in the real world where it takes more than acapella to get by the bellas return in the next chapter in the series that has taken in more than 400 million at the global box office the film opens on december 22nd and stars anna kendrick rebel wilson Haley steinfeld Brittany snow anna camp john lithgow john michael higgins and elizabeth banks jeremy bar saw the first trailer for pitch perfect three Nice. <laughs> I, I'm just looking at the. Oh, come on. All right. So the premise itself embodies what Pitch Perfect Three is. It's like these Bellas who are like, "Oh, we're past the age where we should have stopped, but let's do it again." That's Pitch Perfect Three in a nutshell, right there. It's the first one was really enjoyable. I thought it was surprisingly enjoyable. Second one, not so much. But let's make a third one to, to cap off a trilogy. They say, hey, it's it's the the what was it, the farewell tour. Swan song, yeah. Yeah. The, it, so instead of doing just acapella, which even if the movie is horrible, the acapella will be catchy, hopefully. But then you have them jumping off of ships and it's exploding like it's Baywatch or some shit. <laughs> no, I saw this. I uh, you know what's funny is that Pitch Perfect Two, its opening weekend, actually crushed Transformers at least domestically. Pitch Perfect Two made more money in its opening weekend than Transformers The Last Night did. So surely you know that they were going to make a Pitch Perfect Three. This trailer in particular. I have to sell it. I don't think I'm going to hate on it as hard as some other people on the panel, especially the one that just talked, but <laughs> I just, it, it felt like this movie was, it felt rushed again. A lot of the mm -hmm. jokes felt, they didn't feel, fr it felt like they shot this movie last year and now they're releasing it. I did laugh a couple times, mostly at Elizabeth Banks and John Michael Higgins. Thank God they're back because they kill me every time they're on screen in Pitch Perfect 1, or Pitch Perfect 2 for that matter, Elizabeth Banks is producing this one, but not directing it. So I have to sell it. It's not a hard sell, it's a soft sell. How about you, Christian? The trailer itself, I'm gonna give a hard sell, but uh, the, I understand why they made the movie. I really enjoyed the first one. I thought the first one was yep. very well done. It was clever, it was funny. Um, I, th I thought it worked all the way around. Second one, I thought it suffered from, uh, I'm, again, I like Elizabeth Banks, but I don't think she's a great director, and I thought that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't put together as well as the first one was. This one, the Fast and Furious model does not work for every movie. You can't switch up the, comp the genre altogether with jumping off boats, explosions, kicking people in the face. It's not an action movie. It's not what made the first one so good. Um, I think that it, it, it's gonna, it, if it sticks, this is what the movie is, it's gonna lose exactly what the first one was or what made the first one special. Even the second one had at least that same, it tried to go for the same feel. This seems like it's like an action movie mixed with what we, I know you have to make things different, but this is so radically different. I didn't like what I saw in this trailer. None of the jokes worked for me whatsoever, and I feel like it's getting tired. 
but I do understand why they made it. It's a third movie in the franchise. That the second one did a lot better than anyone thought it was going to make. I mean, they thought it would do good, but it crushed. So it makes sense to make a third, but I just wish it would have been a little, I don't know, smarter. Clark, we selling across the board up here at the main table? We're definitely selling across the board. I think that I actually like this franchise less than you guys do. Oh, really? Um, I, I really, I thought the first one was cute for sure um, and, you know, and charming, but I didn't understand the huge, um, like, social phenomenon that, or, you know, that came about with it. And then with the second movie, I, I'm not going to lie, I didn't see it. Um, so, but this trailer itself um, w fell completely flat for me. I didn't think it was funny. I also thought it was kind of confusing confusing um the, pr the premise itself it seemed overly complicated for what it what the story appears to be so um yeah it's a it's a big sell for me all right well ashley and wendy actually do have some acapella prepared for us right now <laughs> take it away ladies <laughs> um, I right, it was better in rehearsal <laughs> Police Academy movie. We're in the same key. At least. Um, I loved both of the Pitch Perfect movies. The first one I loved. The second one I even loved. The second one I saw it by myself. I was in the seat. I was bopping away. I was like, I want to be a Bella. I want to be up there with them. But watching this trailer, honestly, it kind of sucked. I kind of do sell it. It makes me really sad to say, but maybe they didn't give away the funny moments in the trailer. Maybe the movie will be better. Did I hate the trailer? Kind of, and I'm also really sad to not see Adam Devine back because I love right. Adam Devine so much. And I think the director of this one directs music videos, which doesn't sound too promising. Did I hate the trailer? Yes. Will I probably see the movie? Yes, probably. <laughs> Well, I'm so glad you're also selling across the board because yeah. when you were watching it, you were smiling. I was like, do the hater corner have to, we, are we going to have to break yeah. up? But, <laughs> yeah, I'm selling it because it's called Pitch Perfect and we saw them sing for about 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. And I want to like it. My friend Christy Fit is in the movie and she's great in it, but it's turning into this like slap comedy action mm -hmm. stunt thing and they're Bellas. And I'm like, well, I, I want to to see them so oh, I want to see them <laughs> stick to singing not not being exploded off a boat and and things like that so it's a little disappointing I like the first one so so much and the, the second one was all right I watched it on a plane dozed off a little bit in the middle and <laughs> caught back up at the end for the final performance and also like I just don't understand like now there's even more competition and, and now they're they're bringing Ruby Rose into this and like mm -hmm. now we have to go up with against bands with with instruments and I was mm -hmm. like how was not like it, you didn't think that was ever possible when you, yeah. but it's supposed to be performance. So it's always, I don't know. It just seems very forced. All right. Well, the haters corner doing their job here today. <laughs> Christian, how do you feel about that? Oh, moving on. <laughs> All right. Let's go to our last buy or sell. It's another trailer. Will we like it more than the pitch perfect three? <laughs> Hopefully Fox searchlight has released a new trailer for battle of the sexes. The film is based on the real life showdown between tennis champion and feminist icon, Billie Jean King played by Emma stone and chauvinist has been Bobby Riggs played by Steve Carell. The 1973 match between world number one, Billie Jean King and ex-champ Bobby Riggs was billed as Battle of the Sexes and became the most watched televised sporting event of all time. The film opens September 22nd and also stars Sarah Silverman, Elizabeth Shue, Alan Cumming, Bill Pullman, and Eric Christian Olsen. Ellis Byers sold the new trailer for Battle of the Sexes. It's a tough story to get all of this in one movie when you talk about the tennis aspect is merely a sideshow when you have a conversation about the Battle of Sexes in general between men and women. Back in the 70s too, there's so many elements to it as there are today. And then you also have this, this question of how seriously Bobby Riggs and Billie Jean King were actually taking it personally versus how the public perception of this tennis match was going to be. But what this trailer did is sell me that they're going to take a bold attempt at getting all of this stuff into the movie, and I'm happy about that. I enjoyed the trailer like I did the other one thoroughly. So unlike Pitch Perfect 3, this is a big buy for me. How about you, Clark? Oh, yeah, this is a huge buy for me. I have to say, when I was watching it, I, I kind of felt like this was the movie that Emma Stone should have won her Oscar for, and I haven't even seen it yet. <laughs> um, and I'm, you know, so I, I think the performances look great. I also was really impressed by the style. I felt like, you know, what just from what we could see from the trailer, you know, this looks like it, it looks like a movie that was made in the 70s and um, and it looks like it has heart and it looks like it's also going to be uh, diving into some really interesting discussion points. And it's great. Uh, but, you know, Billie Jean King is is a, she is an incredible athlete and she has such an incredible story and still to this day is outspoken and out there fighting things, f fighting for things off of the tennis court as well. Um, and Steve Carell looks great. So I, I this is such a big buy for me. I, I want to see it now. Jay Money, 
<laughs> I love the nicknames you give me, Mark. I haven't been called that since first grade. Uh, I really, I, I'm buying this too. I, I think it's a, it's a great story to tell. It's a, it's one of those things. Like you were saying, there's a lot to tell in the story as a whole. How do you focus up? And they found something like the tennis match. It's a pure thing. It's competition. It's competition that means more for the characters in it. People can get behind that. I really like that. And this is the '70s. It's not like. This this competition took place in 2017. It's like this is an ice skate uphill for her. You know, it's it's a different time. I'm interested. I, I love both actors. Emma Stone's fantastic. Steve Carell's fantastic. I think Steve Carell is perfect for this role. You know, like absolutely. It's like it's Michael Scott, a little less oblivious, but it's Michael <laughs> Scott. You know, so I, I mean, I think it's great. Yeah, buy it. Christian, thank you for joining us here today. Thank you so what much. do you think of the trailer? Uh, tremendous buy, and I think that the, the word for it is relevant. I mean, for everything going on just in general today, uh, this is a great movie to put out right now and for many different reasons. And I also like, you talk about ice skating up a hill in the 70s, is the fact that this is also Billie Jean King coming out and the fact that she you know what she was dealing with at the time in her with her personal life and the strength that she had of you know being able to be public about things back then is to what she, and then going into this battle right now this what she did this was this was the WWE before the WWE was because he he did he knew what he was doing he knew how to sell these things and when you watch old interviews with him like he's a she was a showman and he knew how to how to make how to make things relevant because he knew at the time this was, he was he was it was he was like popular in the 30s I think like 30s 40s when he was at the top of his game so in order to be relevant again in order to get back back in the public he wanted to put on like a stunt and to do it this way but he also did it I think that he also was very aware that he wanted to subtly empower Billy Jean King I think that we're going to learn more stuff about that but as far as Jeremy Johns what he said the perfect role so this is exactly the type of movie Steve Carell can mm -hmm. do and it's very similar to what I think Robin Williams, the late Robin Williams, did with Good Will Hunting, was that if you watch Good Will Hunting, and I don't know this whole performance, but what my point is that Good Will Hunting, Robin Williams was able to use that acting from Juilliard that he that he used, but the, the, the studying from Juilliard, but the humor, he was able to use that humor. I, that's how I felt that he really was. I feel like Steve Carell could tap into that dramatic acting that we saw in Foxcatcher and add that bit, bit of sense of humor, like Jeremy mentioned, in like in The Office and other movies. So. It's an exciting movie. The trailer looks really good. All um, right. Sorry, one more thing I just wanted to mention, if you don't mind, if we have time. I do not mind. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it's just that uh, the Battle of the Sexes, they had actually played a tennis. So Billie Jean King did not play in the match, but uh, this man did. And he had already played a Battle of the Sexes tennis match, and he crushed his opponent. So keep in mind, in, within the context of this story, Billie Jean King is walking into a thing where she already saw another woman lose uh, in this match. So if you, you know, the stakes are even that much higher historically, which is something that I think is really interesting. The, uh, the movie comes out September 22nd and buckle your safety belts Oscar contenders because <laughs> you might be going up against the Battle of the Sexes on this Friday? fall. Oh. On Friday? Oh, I thought you Battle of Sexes on Friday. There so. is something oh. happening this Friday <laughs> that we're going to talk about in a minute. Clark Wolf is, look, she's a great competitor in the movie Trivia Schmodown. It just so happens she runs into somebody a little bit better, which happens from time to time. I will be taking on that young lady right there in the movie Trivia Schmodown this Friday. Clark, how nervous are you on a scale of 9 or 10? <laughs> I'd say it's a full on 10. I'm certainly nervous. Mark Ellis is a tough competitor. I'm and a beast. You are a beast. You are a movie trivia beast. And I am convinced that this is going to be a very, very tough tough match. She's ranked number four. I'm ranked number five. No shame in losing to me, Clark. Good luck on Friday. <laughs> Good luck, sir. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> All right. We want to remind you guys, too, we launched a new show this past week on Collider Video Friday. Comic book shopping drop. Evan Goldberg is on it. Evan Goldberg, you guys can check him out shopping for comic books with John Schnepp. That is right now on Collider Video's YouTube channel, which you're currently watching. And make sure you guys check out Preacher tonight on AMC. It's a two-part premiere of the new season, last night and tonight. So go watch Preacher. Support our buddy Evan Goldberg because he goes shopping for comic books with John Schnepp. And you guys are going to want to check that out. Now, speaking of television stuff, a new TV talk is going to drop later on today. And we also have new behind the scenes and bloopers and our mailbags that aired this past weekend. Plus, Jeremy Johns, awesome tacular. Will he get a pie in the face this week? You got to wait to find out. Check it out on the Go90 
Network. All right, let's move on to Mailbag. We are going to remind you guys at the end of this show, we're going to save some time to take your live Twitter questions. So go ahead and start tweeting us right now at Collider Video. And each and every day, we try to answer at least one question from the Mailbag as well as our weekend show. So email us anytime. Collider Video at gmail.com. Ashley, how's our mailbox looking today? It's looking good. Freddie Jason writes, hello, Collider gang. I want to get your thoughts on Jordan Peele not wanting to direct Akira and focus on making original stuff. With this and the failure slash controversy of Ghost in the Shell, how long do you think it will be before we hear about an Akira live action going forward? Do you think it will even happen now? Thanks for taking my question. Have a great day. Um, I think it's great that Jordan Peele wants to focus on making independent stuff that he cares about. Not every director is custom made, and every, every director dreams of being a huge franchise star like Michael Bay does. So I think it's awesome that Jordan Peele wants to focus on more original stuff. Somebody will try to adapt to Kira, and hopefully they knock it out of the park. The fact that Jordan Peele isn't that guy doesn't upset me at all. I want to see his vision of stuff, because if Get Out or Key and Peele sketches are any indication, he's got a lot of stuff left in him. What do we got, Clark? I agree with you 100%, actually. Actually, I think if it's the smartest thing in the world that Jordan Peele could do right now, staying and working within within his original sandbox. He 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 he's really smart guy, and uh, and and as a fan, that's what I want to see from him. And as far as Akira goes, uh, I do think that you're going to get an adaptation, and I hope it's everything that the fans want. But I do think that having uh, the right creative team behind the scenes is going to be the most important part. And so hopefully, when they finally get this going, I think wasn't. Leonardo DiCaprio attached to Akira for like a million years. It's had a years. lot of Company. alumni in yeah. the attached Company. category. So, Happy and Way, I think it was. Yeah. yeah, okay. So yeah, so anyway, um, you know, clearly there is a desire to make this happen. Let's hope that once it comes out, it, it's what the fans always wanted. Christian, how do you feel? Um, I agree with Clark. I think that if you look at, certainly with things are happening with like Lord and Miller and what happened with Gareth Edwards in the Star Wars universe, that I think that there's sometimes, there's certain directors that aren't going to prove this theory that I'm about to make, like Colin Trevorrow being one of them. I think that these filmmakers should stick with smaller films at first. Like even Ryan Johnson. Ryan Johnson did, had a couple small ones before he, then he jumped into Looper. And then you you know you, you find your ground, what you can do best, and uh, it helps your it helps your cause later on too. It gives you a little bit more clout. So I think this is a very smart move. Wait before you jump into something like Kira, and then um, yeah, I think this is a very smart move. Money, money, JJ. If it. So that was second grade. <laughs> if it works for you, I think you should stick with it. I think it's a great thing when a director or anyone finds what works for them and goes, nope, to the other things. I'm going to stick with this. It I mean, I had other things I wanted to do, and then I was like, hey, YouTube works. I'm going to stick with that. So I think he should do that. I mean, he took a – he took, I don't know if it's a gamble or just a shot, but he took a thing with Get Out. Get Out works, so stay in that zone. Yeah, I'm watching you guys in the chat room right now. Akira is such a beloved property that it has to be handled with care. A lot of people are saying they don't think it could be a live-action movie. It's just too hard to tackle, so we'll have to see if somebody wants to step up to that plate. But Jordan Peele, I'm happy he's making more smaller independent stuff like what he wants to do. All right, let's move on quickly to a few live Twitter questions. You guys are watching the show. You tweeted us. Wendy Lee's the gatekeeper. How are they looking today, Wendy? All right, we've got a lot of them coming in. First one comes from John Liebrick, who writes, Jeremy mentioned the weird aspect ratio swapping in the last night. Did this bother you or anyone else, and how much? I don't even notice it. I go into movies when I know it's going to happen, and I'm prepared, and I'm ready to look at it, and then my mind just goes blank once the movie starts, which is the best way to enjoy Transformers the last night. So it didn't bother me because I didn't notice it. Jeremy? Oh, uh, I mean, well, we were obviously, each other. yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the thing was, I noticed that, yeah, in my review, I talked about how the aspect ratio goes to IMAX and then small, but it doesn't do it for a scene. It does it in within scenes, within shots. Mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a former projectionist, man, I was paid to notice that kind of stuff. So the whole time I'm like, why are you doing that? Stop that. It just detracted from the already detracted movie. Am I just a dummy? Did you notice this? No, no, uh, I mean, no but I think it, it goes back to your point that I just didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your contribution to that conversation. <laughs> Clark, did you notice it? I'm going to be able to contribute even less. I haven't seen it. So. God, good for you. That's why you have a smile on your face. <laughs> yeah, right? So the sorry. pain isn't so fresh. No, I've learned ratio, my lesson. Movie and it's Stoinks! Okay, we, okay. It can't hurt you anymore. Wendy, what's our next question? Albert Rodriguez writes, We all know that Wonder Woman is the best movie of the summer, but do you guys think any upcoming movie can surpass it? Uh, there's a young man sitting to my right named Christian George Harloff who just saw a movie called Baby Driver. That seems to be on the tip of a lot of people's tongue that could be even better than Wonder Woman. I think Spider-Man's got a shot. War for the Planet of the Apes certainly has a shot. We can talk about it. Yeah, I love yeah. War for the Planet of the Apes. Well, I think that that's the thing. In, and Collider's review of uh, Apes is up also. Perry Nemiroff reviewed nice it. Nice plug that. that I forgot. 
That's all right. Uh, you, you don't have to mention it. But um, the thing is, I think that Apes, Baby Driver, Logan, and Wonder Woman are in my four right now in no particular order. But those are the four of, of my favorites, I think, so far this year. All right, Clark, do you think the Wonder Woman is going to remain the best movie of the summer? Or you see something else sneaking in there? You know what? To be honest with you, I, I have a hard time picking out what the best is. It, it's For me, it's it's what I enjoyed. And, and I am such a huge fan of the Apes franchise um, that I... I, for me, it's not an either or. It's a look how many great summer blockbusters we've gotten this year. I, that's how I choose to look at it. Um, I'm so excited for Apes. I'm actually very excited for for Spider Man. Like you know, I said this with uh, Civil War last year. How I was so over Spider Man, and everybody said, "Don't worry. Once you see Civil War, you're gonna be right back on board." And I was like, "Yeah, sure." And then I saw it, and <laughs> I was just like, "Oh my gosh, give me more Spider Man." If I'm being honest, I haven't loved the trailers that have been out for Spider-Man Homecoming. However, the reviews have been so overwhelmingly positive that that's giving me hope that I think I'm going to love that too. So the, the more good blockbusters, the better. And I'm seeing Baby Driver tomorrow. That's awesome. Uh, 30,000 apes versus Wonder Woman. Jeremy, who wins? <laughs> uh, 30,000 30, apes 30, versus... 30,000 apes. She is a demigod. We'll have to, uh, I think she still gets the W. Yeah, we, we uh, yeah, the W for Wonder and W for Woman, W for Win. That's three Ws. <laughs> I'm going to call you that now. Three W Mark Ellis. WWW Dot jeremyjohns.com oh that was 2015 that was my nickname um no i it's hard to say right now in the beginning of summer what is the best yet it's one of those things i have to marinate on it for the year and then in the end of the year i'm able to go okay what did i like but right now everything's so fresh but you can't discount apes it was really good some other people saying dunkirk atomic blonde maybe even dark tower sneaks in there and becomes the best movie of the summer we'll have to wait and see that is all the time we have today on collider movie talk i want to thank everybody both behind Behind the scenes, Cody running so many ships back there. Look at the Woo! little guy go. And this movie comes out July 7th. And everybody up here at the table with me, Clark Wolf, where can the kids find you when you're not losing to me on Friday? <laughs> Indeed. Well, you can find me at Clark Wolf, Clark with an E, Wolf with an E on the internet. And thank you guys so much for having me. This was super fun. You are an honorable opponent, and I look forward to competing with you on Friday. Great job here today. Jeremy Johns, we compete in other stuff. Uh, you can find me at Jeremy Johns on YouTube, Twitter, rest Oops. of the internet. You can find my show, Awesome Tacular, on Go90. Mark Ellis and I, we throw pies at each other. Be there. Say no to drugs, Christian. Sure. Christian Harloff, Twitter and Instagram. Like Mark mentioned, on Friday, we got the Schmodown tomorrow. Schmodown between six degrees and tough beats. Loser breaks up. Make sure you check that out tomorrow. And over on the haters corner, Ashley Mova. Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Ashley Mova. Happy Monday, guys. And Wendy Lee Zaney. The Movie Couple channel on YouTube and at Wendy Lee Zaney on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. I am merely Mark Ellis. You guys can find me at Mark Ellis Live on Twitter. And I'll be at the Houston Improv this weekend. You can get tickets at MarkEllisLive.com. Thanks so much for joining us, guys. We'll see you tomorrow. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.